Hey, Chicago podcast fans, Marty DeRosa and I are doing a show Black Wednesday. That's November the 25th at Cards Against Humanity headquarters in Logan Square. Right now, I'm just putting the tickets up at ColtCabana.com. You can grab them there. They will go fast. If they don't go, then I'll start advertising on social media. But it's there for you guys first. Grab them quick. It's a small room. All right. Enjoy the show. This is the Art of Wrestling with professional wrestler Colt Cabana. All right, how you guys doing? Come on in. Let's get this done. You're about to listen to The Art of Wrestling, a professional wrestling podcast. It's a life podcast. It's a personal journal. It's an entry into the minds and souls, the hearts and lives of the people involved in the world of professional wrestling. I am your host. My name is Colt Cabana. I am a podcaster. I'm an entertainer. I'm a man who ships my merchandise from my home with my own two little hands. Most importantly, though, I am a professional wrestler. We are sitting here live in the studio, apartment in Chicago, Illinois. Before we go any further, this is a fan support and listener supported podcast supported by people just like you. We give it to you free of charge every single Thursday on ColdCommander.com, SoundCloud, iTunes, wherever you get your podcast from. A couple great ways that you can support, rate, review, and subscribe on iTunes. Tell a friend. Let somebody know. Help out that algorithm. Share a link. Share a link on your Facebook, would you? That's a great way to support. Best way you can do it, though, monetarily. ColtMerch.com, DigitalColt.com. T-shirts, buttons, picture posters, DVDs, digital downloads. I got a whole slew of shirts and a whole slew of digital downloads. Help me keep this dream alive. ColtMerch.com, DigitalColt.com. Taz is on the show. That's exciting. A lot of you guys know my uh, love for ECW, the ECW era, the ECW years. It's that nostalgia about it. My friend and I were watching just uh, yesterday. I decided to jump on the network, and we were watching some world-class and some ECW television and some Clash of the Champions. And, oh, the nostalgia. The nostalgia just kicks in, and you're like... How come I like it when this just southern dude is in front of the ring putting over what's going on on the show tonight? How come I don't mind when you can see the cameraman directly behind the announcer as he's announcing the match for that night? How come I just don't mind the low-rent graphics? Do I think the product today is just so overproduced? Do I sound like that guy who is like, I liked it back when I liked it? Yes. Ugh, I hate that I sound like that. But I do. Oh, it's it's a trip. Taz being on the show is a trip. The man that headlined that first pay-per-view when I used to watch the commercial for ECW Barely Legal on pay-per-view, I would sit and keep the pay-per-view channel on my cable box and just wait for that commercial to come. It was so exciting. Today, it's so easy. You just go on YouTube and you watch it over and over and over again. But you had to sit and you had to wait for it. I could have been watching so many other things. But no, I sat on that pay-per-view channel and I waited for Paul Heyman to come on there and tell me how excited I should be for Taz and Sabu. And I was excited. And I went to my friend Michael Emil Farb's house. How Jewish can you get, right? I went to his house and we watched that first one. He was not an ECW fan. I was like, you have to watch it. You have to order it. And he did reluctantly. I still don't know if he even liked it, but I was in love. I couldn't believe I was watching the pay-per-view in Chicago when it wasn't on television yet. So exciting. And we talk, uh, we talk about the wrestling biz. You know, I was listening to Marin. Of course, I'm a huge Marin fan, and uh, people were giving him shit because he didn't ask questions to Keith Richards, and he said a great thing, and I'm going to repeat what Mark Marin said. He said, if you want those questions answered so bad, go start a podcast, and you interview him, or go start something, and you interview him. Not that we didn't get to anything that I, I didn't want to get to, but the idea is it's more about the feelings than the answers. I mean, sometimes I get in my head, but I always try to make sure to get myself out of my own head. God, it's just about, I don't know, talking in the moment about whatever we talk about. And I mean, obviously, I want to talk about ECW stuff, but I also I love just hearing about that struggle, man. Like, whatever it might be for that specific person. And to me, I, I really relate with those early years or trying to get in stuff. You know, years where it's not about money and it's just about how do I get into wrestling? How do I succeed? And those are the fun years, and that's kind of a lot about what Taz and I talked about. So every year or so, I have this pain in my lower back. It's something with the lumbar. I'm pretty sure when I'm done wrestling, I'm going to have to get a whole backyotomy. But every year, it kicks up, and it kicked up while I was in Russia, and I got through the match, and then 
after the match when the adrenaline was all gone, I could barely move and I was able to get through it. And I only bring it up because I I want you guys to get a glimpse into our lives. And it's not just me and it's the decisions that we make. And now at 35 years old, this was a decision that I would make, you know, when I was 25. But I still feel that I have to live the same lifestyle. And I had a show. And I swear the last time I did this because, yeah, because I was talking to Pretty Peter Avalon, who I wrestled, because last time I wrestled for Championship Wrestling from Hollywood, the same exact thing happened to me. That's so weird that that's, that's when it was. And for the, for the podcast fans, you could probably know the timeline because I remember him saying when I went out there to wrestle, I was like, I don't know why I'm out here. I could barely move. And the same kind of thing happened as I wrestled Peter Avalon on Championship Wrestling from Hollywood Television. I was a little better this time, though, because the moment I came home, I went right to the chiropractor and got a massage. And I don't mean to sound like a Richie Rich, but one of my best friend's brother is a chiropractor, and he just straight up hooks it up. So if you're in Chicago, go see Dr. Jeremy Weiss at Chiropractical Solutions on Belmont. I know that I should be taking two, three, four weeks off, but in my head, it's like I've got this booking. I got to do it. I'm going to go out there. People want to see me. I know Amanda out there wants to make sure I'm in California, and I can't let her down. So I have these week breaks in between these Monday through Thursdays where you just pray it all goes away and you slab on the tiger balm and you put a tennis ball on the ground and you try to rub this knot out and you stretch as much as possible only to do it the the next week. So, I mean, I sit here and it's better. I'm worried about October because I'm going to Japan and I remember this happening last time when I was in Japan, the same kind of injury, but this time it's not the week before. So uh, all I can do is, I don't know, stretch and prevent. And then when it gets better, I'll never do any of that again. And then I'll get hurt again. And I'll go back to that routine. It seems strenuous. It's actually seemed to work out for me these last 17 years. <laughs> Song of the Week this week is brought to you by DraftKings.com. Your season-long fantasy football team may be doing strong, but you don't have to wait until week 16 to get paid. Put your fantasy skills to test every week this season at DraftKings.com, America's favorite one-week fantasy football site. One week fantasy means no season long commitment. Got an injured player? Seems like they're getting injured all the time. It's okay. It's basically a new season every week. You're never stuck with the same players. DraftKings is crowning a new millionaire every week this season. Turn your love of football into a life-changing payday. Just pick your players, pile the points, and pick up your cash. That's it. Just that easy. You never experienced football like this before. It isn't fantasy as usual. It's DraftKings. It's the big time. Hurry to DraftKings.com now and use the promo code RUSSEL. Play for a free shot at $1 million in this week's Millionaire Maker event. And to wrestle for free entry now only at DraftKings.com. DraftKings.com. That's DraftKings.com. The song this week is by our good friends, Anti-Scene. Check out their music and upcoming events at Anti-Scene.com. The song is called Sabu. Makes a lot of sense. Enjoy it. We'll be back with Taz. Promotional consideration paid for by the following. Hey, we're also brought to you by Tops this week. I grew up on Tops, trading cards, getting them signed, collecting every single Minnesota Twins card, including but not limited to Dan Gladden, Burt Blylevin, and Roy Smallman. Of course, Kirby Puckett. Let's not forget Kirby. Now Tops has brought the world of trading cards to digital. Tops Huddle features officially licensed NFL digital cards. Fans can collect cards of their favorite players from their favorite teams. Watch your collection grow by opening packs and making trades with other users. We're going to get you to the Tops app. It's free to download and it does so much. Play cards and earn points in real time. Daily fantasy style games based on how players perform on game day. Over 300 million Tops digital packs have been opened since 2012. For football and especially fantasy football fans, this app is a must-have. Download it for free in the App Store or Google Play and get 10 packs for free today. Again, that's Tops in the App Store. Check them out at tops.com. Usually I don't say, I don't give a time context of what we're doing, but we're at like this independent show. Yes. And I love the idea because that's a lot of what I wanted to talk about here is, is I kind of think, I don't know, it might be weird for you, but like I know you of these independent roots a little bit. Yeah. And you haven't been to one of these shows in it, years. Tell me what you, said, what you said when you came in. When we were walking up here to go to this studio to, di- uh, to do this, yeah. I uh, I'd said to you, man, it's so weird coming to a building and, and at an independent show at a, a small church 
especially in Brooklyn. This, yeah. this is my roots as working back years ago, 20 or 25 years. It wasn't even called, you know, independence. Yeah. It was just, what was it called? Uh, just like work, you know, like, <laughs> <laughs> dude, it didn't have a name. I swear to God. The, it, didn't. it didn't. Where do you think the word independence came from? Um, is there somebody I, that coined that? I wouldn't be shocked somehow for WWE to separate themselves. You know what I mean? Like, oh, that was like a taboo yeah, word. Yeah, because yeah. you'll hear like Jim Cornette and all those guys talk about them outlaw shows. Yeah, the outlaw, outlaw shows. You see, of course, the guys down south, like Corny and those guys. Yeah. And and that was the thing back in the day, man. If you were from like like guys like me and even before me, the guy who broke the ice for the Northeast guys was, was Mick, was Mick Foley. And Heyman, as a non-wrestler. Broke the ice in terms of what? To get into that next level. You know what I mean? Like, like, I like Mick when he worked when he went to Memphis. I'm telling you right now. So he was on these outlaw shows. You're saying? Yep. Yeah, yes, but in New York. Okay. You know, he he broke in with Danucci in Pittsburgh, but as you know, he's a Long Island, New York guy. Mm. So we all would work, man, like all over the Northeast and a lot of New England and Brooklyn, Queens, uh, you know, all that kind of deal. And Mick, when he went down to I want I think it was Memphis. Yeah. That was like a big deal. Like for for us for the guys that were wrestlers that yeah. were trying to break in that were all around mixed age we yeah. were like dude he made it everybody <laughs> God, they couldn't believe that he got to Memphis no no we were happy for him no it wasn't nothing like that it was just like we how come he was the first one to go I don't know I just think he had good size back then size was a big deal he was just a big guy and he was different than everyone yeah and for a guy his size he did yeah as you know some crazy stuff right. and he could work you yeah. know I mean he sold well his offense was intense you know so and and. It, it was less reality based then too, mm -hmm. um, but Mick just I think cause his promos too. He's kind of was ahead of the curve on a lot of us. Yeah, and when when we think about that, I guess so you thought like hey like that was the territories Memphis and that was like big so there was no well yeah in See, New York no, well here's the thing like, obviously New York well New York yeah well that was obviously right. Vince McMahon right but back then I'm talking about like late '80s you know uh, if you were working for the AWA or world class in texas or memphis or in canada calgary or dude you, 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 it was huge and of course the holy grail was japan so like the first time i got to work in japan it was a huge deal and then when i got like a contract with new japan it was like oh my god that's it i made it you know but i really didn't but I, in my crazy mind yeah. and my my brethren around me you know the northeast guys mm -hmm. we, we were like that's huge so for mick like he really i felt you know, as a New York wrestler, like, he broke the ice. And, like, I was talking about Heyman because Heyman, he, I don't know who, who ended up, like, down in the Memphis territory first. Was it Heyman or Mick? I really don't know. But Paul was another New York guy. And it's like, I didn't really know Paul then, but it was a big deal. How is this guy down? Were you like, how is this guy down yeah, here in how general? How is this guy down? <laughs> then once I heard him cut, I heard of him. And then when I heard him cut promos, and to me it was like, ah, oh, this guy's niches. He looks like... Um, like, what's his name? Uh, Johnny Danger. Johnny Danger. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so he's got the Paulie Danger. Ah, this guy's just a false. I thought he was like a jabroni. Yeah. Right? But then I heard like some, some like videotape on his, like his promos. Mm -hmm. I'm like, all right, my man can talk. All right. <laughs> <laughs> and then I got to obviously know him and meet him. And yeah. Well, like, so <laughs> what was the big, what was the big thing in New York then? I guess like, so, I, like, because right, you have your stages and you're like, oh, if I can only get to this one thing in this area and then maybe I can go to Memphis or whatever it is. What, was there a big thing then? For me, like I, I wanted to obviously work for you know the WWF, right? Yeah, but that's the biggest. And, right, and then there was yeah. NWA. Those yeah, were the yeah. big boys. And like the next, the, the lower level kind of was AWA. And I'm like, oh, man. But, but, I, but, but underneath that. Oh, you that, say underneath that? Like ICCCWW, no. <laughs> you know, there's nothing. Dude, I held titles there. <laughs> <laughs> no, but that, maybe that was, you know, okay, like starting I yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, the IWCCW, and I worked for them when it was just ICW. How about that? So yeah, that was the Savoldi's, Mario Savoldi's territories. But that, they were based out of Pawsippany, New Jersey. So he booked mostly, you know, the Northeast guys. And yeah, for us, that was like our um, Memphis per se. But we weren't working as much as those guys. We'd work maybe once or twice a week. That's about it. But when you start training, you're like, man, if I could just get to that, no, right? No, I wasn't like that. No, I, actually, I wasn't. Tell you the truth. I kind of was a little thick-headed. I, I kind of had, I was delusional is a better word. I was like, no, nah, I'm going right to the top. Right to the top. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought I was going to do it in like a year. Yeah. And then Johnny Rods, who broke me, was like, no, no, bro, you got to relax. You know? <laughs> it's fun because I had the same thought, like, because I'll, be, I'll be training guys a lot recently. Cool. And, and like, if, if you go into training thinking like, Man, if I could just get on this one local show, like how, like, 
and I think it works with any business because you know even like as as now like podcasters, both of us or whatever. Yeah. If, yeah. if let's say we want to get in entertainment, like if we if you just go in going, man, I hope I can get into blockbuster movies. Yeah. As opposed to going like, if I can just get in this one TV commercial, it would be the greatest. Yeah. And then you work your way. You work slow, your way. Work your way slow. Yeah, it's true. Like you were a WWF I, guy, you right? Know, yeah, because I was because I was a little bit. I was like, oh man, it's like. I was so mature, like in my brain, I was so competitive and combative, right? And and I had a, a judo background, I had a you know heavy football background, so I I wasn't like a huge wrestling fan, you know. Like if you sat here with like Tommy Dreamer, I mean Dreamer's goal his whole life, like in high school, was to do what he's doing now, and he completed it. I was kind of a casual WWF fan. Mm -hmm. I was a New York kid, and I'd watch it at midnight. Oh, Bruno Sammartino is cool, you know. Yeah, you know, superstar Billy Graham, but I wasn't like a diehard, so I needed a job, and 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 that was my thing. But then I saw I gained a rapid respect. You fell in love with it. Good sure. God, I did. Yeah, how, and it was hard as hell. I know? would, God, I would. How you look at that and just go, I need a job. Yeah. So, so what happened? So what happened? Well, you? I. <laughs> I, I got into a little, a little scrap in college, and I kind of was removed not just from the football team, but from the college. So I kind of was like, take it easy, bro. See ya. I had to go, right? Can, can you dive into that or well, no? I, just, I got into a little fight in a locker room with a guy, and then I hurt the guy. And I, I got the better end of the fight. I won the fight. Yeah. It was kind of but a scrappy But you lost kid. the battle. I lost the war, <laughs> You bro. lost the war. Because <laughs> then I had to deal with my old man. So <laughs> he was hot. He's like, what the hell, you know? And, and Were you uh, on a scholarship? Uh, I would play D2 ball, so. Okay. At, back then, it wasn't. Mm -hmm. No, I wasn't. So, I was financial aid. I mean, my family had no money, so I was like, I was kind of there on a full ride, thanks to the state of New York. You know right. what I mean? <laughs> so, rides a ride. Yeah. But anyway, I um. Uh, then when I came, I had to come home. I had no money. I had nothing. And I lived in the basement at my parents' house, which wasn't fancy. He's like, dude, you, you're gonna get a job. And I'm like, yeah, I know. And so I'm, I was bouncing. I was working security. I'm just like, I was working construction. I was a wheelbarrow guy at my you uncle's construction. You sound just so typical. This sounds so <laughs> typical New York. Like, <laughs> if I was to look. Oh, you're from movie, Chicago. It's not much different. I Come know on. it isn't, but God, just getting kicked off, then coming back, living with the parents oh, yeah, in the bro, basement, doing yeah, the yeah. shit jobs. <laughs> like, I'm picturing it right now. I'm getting a great visual. It's, it's of a it. shoot, man. And then, um, and then he, my dad, knew a guy. My dad was like an amazing bowler. Like when, when he, he was, uh, I'm, I'm shooting, he was like quasi on a tour, you know, like a pro bowler's tour. But like he bowled for what they call action. Okay. Basically, he King, made his living. Kingpin. Yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah. So that's what he did. And he was a hustler. He, <laughs> sorry. You think God rest his soul. But sorry, yes. Sorry. No, it's all good, bro, because he was. But we're, I mean, we're hustlers. Yes, we are hustlers. Yeah. That's true. We are. I, I guess it's in my genes. Yeah, I, never, I right? have the genetics. So, um, you know, not that, but like my father was a clothing salesman, and years later, same I, deal. Yeah. I find myself selling clothes, you know, <laughs> selling t shirts. <laughs> sell t shirts. Like that selling merch. Yeah, exactly. You're selling merch. Yeah. So he, my dad knew a guy that he had bold wood that knew a guy in real New York, right? Yeah. Um, that knew this pro wrestling guy, they used to train people, that was tra starting to train people in Brooklyn. So there was no going on the internet and looking up the unpredictable Johnny Ross. Right. But I knew of his name. I said, oh, God, he would lose matches all the time on TV. I remembered the guy. So I didn't really have like a respect for it. And then I went to meet with him. He said, well, you know, I'm cutting out a lot of stuff. Yeah. So I met with the guy. Well, let me ask you this. So that's one option. Was there like other options, or like how come wrestling was the one that stuck with you as like the oh this is the job? Um, it, it, I didn't know it was going to be the job. Okay, because you were like I need a job. I need a job. <laughs> but this is what I was going to get to. So when I started, when I when I met with Johnny Rods and I told him all the stuff that I'm going to do in the business, he laughed in my face. Yeah, I met him on Jamaica Avenue in East New York. Okay, and for New Yorkers, they know what that is. It's, it's kind of like it, this. It makes this neighborhood we're in right now yeah. looks like Hollywood Hills. So um. He said, listen, bro, you got to learn some stuff first. You know, you don't have a lot of size. You know, you, at the time, I was like 260. I was muscular as hell. He goes, no, no. I mean, he goes, you're short. I go, yeah, so what? He goes, I go, I'm tough. He goes, I know, but you got to learn some stuff. This is before we even walked into school, bro. <laughs> you were I'm, ready. I'm cutting promos on this guy. Like, you know, and my father's dad, and he's like, he's telling me, relax. You know, he's telling me, I'm sorry, my son's a little bit, you know, he's, he's kind of like a little out there you know and he's like no Did john he's like yeah 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 yeah." but i was stupid in, in yeah. a way because i just had i just felt like i was just gonna go in there and just beat everybody up yeah which i couldn't have done anyway but in my mind that's what i thought i was a kid yeah well i started to get trained and after no lie two sessions with him now this was when it was me and i started the same day with a guy mondo clean if you remember yeah him, okay? yeah we started the same day together and uh 
Big Dick Dudley, Alex Rizzo, God rest his soul, if you remember him. Mm, cool, of course. We, yep, we started the same day together. And, and uh, a guy named Bialo the Giant, who was just him. a big, heavy guy. And he, he was a, just a huge guy that really couldn't work well. But he was like the senior student. But and all big dudes in there. Big dudes. Yeah. And, and, and I was like this runt, you know? So right there, I like that. Because like for me now, now it's a challenge, you know? Because that was my whole thing as a football player. I was always on the side, you know? So I, I dug it, you know? I liked being a little engine that could, you know? Mm -hmm. So after two sessions, I mean, I was getting my ass whooped, not by anyone else except Johnny Rods, because he wanted to teach me. Now at the time, Johnny was still in ring shape. He was working. And I, in two days, I had a whole new respect, not just for the business, but for Johnny Rots, you know, because I just got, I guess what I learned was called stretched, you know, mm. <laughs> more than once, you know, yeah. and, and, and to humble me, humble yeah, me. Yeah. And you got the wake up call, which yes. is nice that you were like, it snapped and you got it. Yeah. And you move forward because, you know, it's a weeding out process Dude. that we hear about now and still happens. Absolutely. And, right. Colt, I would drive home in my beat-up 73 Malibu, listening to, and tell your boy this. My podcast? No, oh. not your podcast. The Cult of Personality okay. on my cassette. So you nice. let him know that. Yeah. And I'm like, God, if I ever make it, this is my song. Oh, no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I wasn't really a Cult of Personality, but I just loved the song, right? Yeah. Anyway. I had those songs that I listened yeah, to. Yeah, of course, that right? Like, yeah. This would fit me. And I would drive home after two sessions, no, no BS, man, in tears. Just not just physical pain, but like I never was humbled like that yeah. by another person. You know what I mean? And and I, I would go home and talk to my girlfriend about it, who's now my wife, and she she's like, Well, you can't quit. Don't you know, she didn't want me to do Did this. Did you want to quit? I wanted to quit, but I knew I couldn't quit because of my pride. And she <sighs> didn't want me to get into this from jump street. Yeah. Cause you know, she just did, she wanted a guy nine to five that, you know, had a regular job. And but she's like, she knew I wasn't a quitter because you can't quit. You Still know? your wife, and boy, did, yeah, you she not, is. did you not live that life? <laughs> oh, man, that nine brother. to five life. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dude. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But so what happens, bro, is now I'm trained with Johnny Rods for a month, and next thing you know, I get this gig with the Long Island Railroad, like as a trackman, like digging holes and $15 an hour, yeah. union benefits the whole deal i'm like wow this is pretty legit i'm making money and i'm training to wrestle and i could go to the gym after the you know the railroad stuff so then i you know my girl will be impressed yeah with she, me. she was she's like listen maybe this, you're doing good now you're training for a month and a half this wrestling yeah maybe you, you know take right. yeah, bye-bye you know and i'm like no 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 and 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 i ended up staying on the long island railroad for about six and a half years until i finally you know got a real break so, so that was that was the job that you stuck with. Yes. What was uh, I? I, I, I told you I was going to get to it. Yeah. See, yeah. <laughs> it took me a long time. Oh, you know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I, I know this is jumping, but like, um, uh, what was the official like? I can quit the Long Island Railroad and wrestling will Ooh. take me. Uh, ECW. ECW. Um, Eastern champ. The, the original ECW. When when Eddie Gilbert had just left the book, Paul came in to take the book from Todd Gordon. That was um, that was it right there. I mean, when Paul took over. And I started working for Paul. You know, he he sat with me and said, "Look, this th look at this thing is gonna is gonna blow up. I'm gonna make this thing blow up." And Todd's supportive of it, and and we got the money. You're not gonna be a millionaire, you know, but maybe down the road you'll make some legit money. Just stick this out. And I loved it, you know, what I mean, because I was working. Now I worked a lot before that. The whole yeah. IWCCW, also, all that. Also, I I'm mean, going fast forward in six years here. You know, no, but years. I'm saying like. Uh, I could, and, and this is probably, we'll see, Ben, but like the football player view, I played football. I, right. I, I get remember it. you told me that, yeah. And I could tell from you, it's just like, that was your head coach who was, right? He Amen. Was, yeah, yeah, and you were like, I'm on the team. That, that's in. a great analogy, yeah. and you're right. Yeah. yeah. And that's what it was. And, well, the one that was n not really like uh, embracing it was my, now she was my fiance. Yeah. You know, so we evolved, and she's like, well, you know, she met Paul. She's like, eh. <laughs> A lot of this was a normal girl here. Yeah, you know? right, right, right. <laughs> so, so, but, um, so the, so when you stop the railroad because it's a union job, it's uh, there's so much there, and like I, I don't know it as well because I, you know, I stopped, I stopped my normal job. A lot of people who do, you know, right, they put yeah, a cut to their normal course. job, but like I wasn't making big money at all. You know, I, I think the story I tell is like I made eleven thousand as a teacher and eight thousand as a wrestler, and I was like, all right, I can. Do that eight. I didn't know you were a teacher. I yeah, know, I, yeah. I, I was a teaching assistant for two years. But the question I have for you on your podcast, Colt, were you a better teacher than Matt Stryker? 
No, 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 no. I was a teaching assistant, only doing it. Oh, come on. I was oh, you a chance to, to bury Matt. Sorry. I love no. Matt, but come on. Oh, and he's the smartest guy in the world. Yeah, he's pretty smart. Yeah. Jeez. Unless you ask Raven, because Raven will tell you he's well, the yeah, he, Raven, he, of course, is the smartest guy in the world. The words that come out of Stryker. Unless, he Stryker, just, yeah, unless he's, he's just a great memorizer of words. He is. He's, yeah, he is. He's Maybe a lot of things, That's Matt. it. Yeah. I, know, I like Matt. <laughs> no, I like Matt, too. I like Matt. Um, <laughs> is, yeah, so... like. Was ECW full time? Full time? <laughs> well, because it wasn't ECW; it was Eastern Championship. Correct. Right? It, it ended up being because we were. I'm trying to remember now. We would do it. We would do house shows like on on Friday. We would do TV Saturday, and we'd have like another house show on um, Sunday. And I was making enough money per shot that you know I was able to get by. You know, I was I was still living at. I'm trying to remember. I was still living at home and. And then after about a year with Eastern Championship Wrestling, you know, Paul and Todd, they, you know, I started to get over a little bit. And my work was was there, and I started making more money. And and then, uh, you know, we ended up my wife and I, well, my fiance and I at the time, we bought a, a small house, and I was able to get a house. We always wanted to own a home, you mm-hmm. know, and that was our first house. And and so yeah, I was able to do yeah. well. So money wise, like after the, it was always kind of a slow. I mean, yeah. that's kind of how mine was. It was always like a nice, real slow yep. increase. Yep. Same here. Yeah, which I think is is. I think is the better if you want long term success it's in appreciation. Wrestling. Yeah, right. Yeah, if come you get on, that bro. Quick, I mean, and then you have to go down to the, the shitty paydays. Yeah, of course, but it, it is it, to your point. It's an it's the total appreciation because you know you you learn to just appreciate what you're heading towards, and once you get it, you're very protective of mm-hmm. it, and you have it now. You know what I mean? How are you with money? Are you a spender or are you a saver? I'm I'm the spender. She's the saver. You are a yeah. spender. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. See, yeah. I feel like as as a guy who's gotten the slow, like I remember trying to make a living off of twenty grand yeah. a year or ten grand a year. Yeah, and like I just feel like I never want to not yeah live like that. You know what? It's cold, dude. Here's the thing. Because once I started making some money, I never had money as a kid. My family never had money, you know. So when I had the opportunity to like spend some money, I went a little crazy. Yeah, okay. Not, nothing crazy. But there's crazy. two sides of that, right? There's yeah. guys like me and there's guys like you. Correct. Yeah, yeah. And th- but then, I, then before I got married and we had a little sit down, obviously my wife was a big influence on me. I uh-huh. keep talking about her. So she said to me, uh, "Listen, you need to chill and you need to learn how to." She taught me how to have a savings account, and I, I was just, dude, I was a street kid. Right. You know what I mean? So and and now. Well, now, meaning the past 15 years. No, I once I, you know, was doing really well in ECW, became extreme, and then went to WWE. No, I, I'm not the type of guy that's rolling around in, like, you know, right. crazy, like, uh, over-the-top, super expensive cars. Monster and, trucks. Yeah, and yeah. No, I'm not I'm like what, one of those guys. What no. was the first, what was the purchase that you look back and go, Jesus, why did I do that? Uh, when I signed with WWE, I, WWF, um, I got a, a Escalade that had every, a, a brand-new Cadillac Escalade that had every... Nook, cranny, bells, and whistles you could imagine. Give, it, on give it. me everything. Uh, and I didn't, need, I didn't use half of it. <laughs> and half the time I was on a plane in a hotel in a rent a car. So the car just, like, really, I didn't even use it. Yeah. You know? Distilled water? Does it have a distilled <laughs> water dispenser in there? And I'm like, this was stupid. What yeah. am I doing? You know what I mean? So, you know. Well, good. But it, it's like now, you know, then once, once we had a child, you know, then it was like you instantly change. And, and then I was like, well, it's about, hit, you know, for his college education and, you know, yeah. for him to have more than us. You know? uh, Tasmaniac. Oh, the man. Tell me. But yeah, <laughs> kind of. Because that's. I mean, yeah, listen, ECW was like, and I talk about it a lot on this podcast, like that was, you know, that was my 16, 17, 18. Yeah. When I was 16, you know, ECW, so like, when, yeah, yeah, okay. so for me, it was just like, that was like everything that represented the cool wrestling. That's cool, man. Yeah, it's nice it, to hear. Yeah, for sure, man. And uh, so I remember I, you talking when you came on my show, we talked a little bit about that and I, I didn't know that about you until you said oh, it, but yeah, it's cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, and I had, well, Chicago, bro, we were hot, man, back in the yeah, day. But we, you, we didn't get you, the, we like, you guys were. It took a couple of years to get when you got on TV. You oh, guys, yeah, yeah, yeah. You had really I mean. hit the stride. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, so yep, like yep, by yep. the time like I was introduced to everybody, you know, I read the magazines and I saw the Tasmaniac, and then you know, they, like PWI would show the transformation yeah. of before and after, <laughs> kind of. You yeah, know? Yep, yep, yep. And so yeah, so when you guys hit uh, the stride, you know, you were on top, Sabu was on top. I yep. had this conversation, and we don't. I don't know if we have to want to talk about, it, but I, I was just looking back at like I watched something with Sandman and how over he was, and then like I just look now like. Fuck, he wasn't the best like wrestler. No, in the, but he was. He was the. He was in these. So, uh, here's what I'll say. Like he was in these main event matches. Yep. Like, and I was like, you could put Taz in a main event match. You could put Sabu in a main event match. You could put Raven in a main event match. Like they can hold their RVDs. You know, right. they can hold of their course. own in the wrestling. Yep, yep, yep. But Sam is just like he did main event matches. He was smart. He was very intelligent. The way he worked, he knew. 
he, he, he literally couldn't do a headlock takeover, I don't think. No, I, I think you might be right. But he <laughs> he knew enough to get by. And if you notice, his matches were never long. And if they were longer, he was selling most of the time. So he was very humble. He knew his, he was a character in a, in a positive way. His entrance was was the bomb. Yeah, he was you the know? man. The man, bro, yeah. the man. I mean, the guy was over, over, over. So him and Dreamer were the two guys that they almost would get hot if Paul wanted them to win the match. Hmm. They wanted to lose all the Sandman matches. was like that too. I know Tommy was. Sandman there. was like that. Okay. You know what I mean? I mean, I didn't, I never worked with Sandman a ton, you know, uh, I guess because our characters, our styles would have really, you know, I needed somebody to go that I could work with. Paul was smart enough to book me with guys that could kind of get my stuff over. And I say that humbly. I'm not, I'm not, because, you know, all the different suplexes and stuff back then, you know. So who was uh, so, uh, and I do want to get to the Tasmanian. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. But, but who was who was the guy that you you're like? Oh, I'd like to because I have a I have a certain kind of person who I'd be like that'd be the best heel for my baby face. Yeah. So who's like a wrestler? What kind of style do you like that you'd be like if I had a chance? I mean, the guy. I mean now. I mean today's no, guy. No, no, it's just. just well, that's what. Well, it's like a guy like Sabu or Van Dam, guys that were highly athletic. That I, because I couldn't do all all the crazy high spots those guys did, so I had no problem eating those moves. Okay, I, I was I, my body was rigid and rugged. I could take those bumps. I could lay on a table while you kill me, as long as we're cool. I'm gonna get to throw you a few times. Yeah, here. yeah, yeah. So you're you like know, the athletes who can yeah, fly the athletes. For, yeah. Thank you. That's the best way to right. put it. Yeah, I, I, that's what I was about because I considered myself athletic, but my style I needed someone that could kind of bump and that was tough, all, physically tough. Mm-hmm. And you know, Sandman was a very tough guy, but. He, he was also a big dude. He was like 6'5". Six, six, yeah, yeah. So it was like, it was, I, you know, Paul just never really put us together much. But, uh, um, you know, uh, you know, and and I wasn't going to stand there and let you hit me with a cane as hard as you could 150 <laughs> times. That just wasn't going to happen, bro. <laughs> uh, Tasmania. So yeah, jo- you're at the Gleason's gym. No, I'm sorry. You're at Johnny Rods's gym. Johnny Rods. I started with Johnny before he even went to Gleason's. We were at some couple of little dive gyms here in Brooklyn. And then, uh, and then evolved into uh, Gleason's gym. We went to Gleason's. And was Tasmaniac the first character? <sighs> no, Kid Crush. Hey, yeah. Yeah, bro, Kid Crush. Where'd that yeah. come from? Well, I'll tell you where it came from. It was a combination of two things, like your love for Crush Soda Pop. Yes, I loved Crush Soda Pop. <laughs> no, it was uh, people never really, and even to this day, they don't. A lot of people don't know what nation, nationality I am. So I would get, oh, you're Samoan. Oh, you're Hispanic. Oh, you're Italian. Oh, maybe you're Polynesian. You know what I mean? Like, so I had all that stuff. I'm Italian, okay? So what I did was, I said, well, the Polynesian thing's cool. You know, I saw like guys like Jimmy Snooker and these guys in Morocco and the Samoans. So I, I, the Kid Crush gimmick was barefoot. And, and then Sting, I saw this guy Sting for UWF, for, for Watts' thing. I saw like videotape on this guy because I started to really become a student of the game. And he had the paint and all this. And, and it was something about this flamboyant, this blonde hair, this big muscular guy. It, looked, it was cool. I didn't have his physique or his height, but so I painted my face kind of similar to his. I had like a flat top that was dark, so it was a combination of Sting and like Snooker, which is just crazy. Kid Crush, right? Yeah, which sounds like King Kalua. You don't remember him? Yes, of course <laughs> okay. I do. Yeah, I know Mike. Yep, and that was a long time ago. And I think I did the gimmick better than King Kalua. Was but it a similar? I digress. Gimmick? It was. It was similar. That's what yeah. it sounds like in my he, head. He had a few years' experience on me at that time, but then I'm like, this isn't working. You know, and then I started, you know, people also would, I had a nickname in school, Taz, because I was shorter, darker complexion, like the Tasmanian devil. So I'm like, let me, let me do this Tasmanian devil type thing, but I don't want to be a cartoon character. I always was into, I want to be taken serious. I don't want to be a joke, you know. So I dressed kind of like with the fur and the barefoot, you know, and paint face and crazy long hair, like dreadlocks. I did all this crazy stuff. But when the bell rang, I was hell bent that people respected the way I worked and my style, and they would giggle and laugh. And I'd work shows like this until I got in a ring, and like, oh, okay, this guy is not playing around. Mm-hmm. So that was a big thing to me. I wanted to keep credibility as an athlete. And that was just you, just you churning, or people influence, or it was helping. me. It was me. And and I remember back then I bounced it off Johnny Rods. He thought it was a good idea, mm-hmm. you know, because he had me working. He would, you know, obviously had hookups with all these books, uh, getting us booked on these independent shows in the Northeast. And I did the job forever. I was just, I was like a, just a job guy. I would work 20 minute matches, but yeah. I was, because I was small, I was, you got to lose. No, that's how I was. <laughs> when did Tasmaniac start to take off a little bit? ECW, uh, well, I went to Japan as a Tasmaniac first for, um, uh, for Wing, this company called Wing, oh. years ago. Yeah. yeah. And um, 
this is when so, uh, uh, FMW was hot. Wing was like an alternative. Right. And I'm very interested in how you got there. Like how... Uh, uh, I got there... I mean, had you started getting good? Or were you kind of looking back where you're like, I wasn't that good, but I went to Japan. No, it was cool. I was actually pretty good back then. Okay. I, was, I did all right, you know, because of suplexes, you know? So... They, the, they they liked me there, and I worked, I think, two tours for them. But and who saw you, right? Someone it had was, to. It was, uh, I think it might have been, uh, uh, what's his name? Fumi Saito. I think that's who it was. Because he was always in the States, like a photographer, you know? Oh, okay. And, and uh, what's his name? Uh, Wally Yamaguchi. Mm -hmm. Okay. <clears throat> and then. Why I, do I know Wally Yamaguchi? He's with New Japan. He's, for years, he was a referee, and, and, and Wally's like a legendary referee, yeah. but part of the office for New Japan okay. for like. Is he decades. Red Shoes? No, I don't know. I don't think he's red. Okay. I know. I don't think he is. Okay. But anyway, I. That's how the whole thing with those guys happened with, uh, with uh, the la la um, wing wing. Thank you. And um, who'd you go over with? Oh, man. Do you remember? Like that. I first do tour? remember Kevin Sullivan. That's when I I first met Kevin Sullivan, uh, and he kind of took me into his wing, and Which I learned. Is nice. Yeah, man, I learned a ton. Then we ended up hooking up in ECW. Did you go in like scared that he wouldn't, and he would like almost like bully you on these tours? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Because um, it's a, it's a, it's oh, a I got nice ripped left it? and right. Okay. Like the first the first time I worked for my first match, I had to work with this guy Gypsy Joe. I didn't know who oh, he was. God, your first match ever. In Japan. Japan. In Japan, yes. And and I get off this plane. They pick me up. They bring me to this, this uh, Cork and Hall, okay? Mm -hmm. And I see the car, Gypsy Joe, first match. And I didn't know who it was. And I, and then Kevin Sullivan said, well, it's that old guy sitting over there. And he's, I said, he's, he's bro, still he's like, like decrepit, like rigor mortis is setting in, you know. Creeper style. Yeah. yeah. And I'm like, oh, my God. I go, Kevin, how am I going to? He goes, yeah, you got to be very gentle with him. He he he's I didn't know him. Yeah. He's like he's he's just just be very very gentle with him. He he's a very broken down old man. Just he's got nothing. I'm getting ribbed. I didn't know it at the time. Uh, and then I go out there with this guy, and he beat the shit out of me. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, we're in a real fight now here. Like so now I'm like, frig this whole you know old guy. I'm punching this guy in his head. Slapping him in his face as hard as I can, and he keeps coming, bro. And it's like, come on, you motherfucker. He's hitting himself with chairs. He's cracking me with chairs. Hit me with it. I'm hitting him with chairs as hard as I can. Are you blown away? Or I can't <laughs> believe what's happening. I can't believe it. Yeah. Right? I'm like, this guy's an animal. I couldn't stop this guy. God, Toughest my, my, guy I've my ever mind would have been bro, in I was, so many places. <laughs> and then I, I'm selling. I'm beat up. My eye's bleeding. Right, I'm on the outside, of, and I peek, and I see the entranceway, and I see all the boys are watching, laughing, Kevin Sullivan, whooping yeah. me off. Oh, man, bro, what a rip. And then and then Joe, Gypsy Joe, when we got in the back, was laughing. He hugged me, kissed me on the head. He goes, oh, oh bro, nice. we had to break your cherry, you know? And, yeah. And it was cool. Did the rest you, of the tour, I worked with him a lot, and it was cool. I was yeah. going to say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Did, did he tell you, like, how, how did Gypsy Joe become a thing? Because he, he's, like... He, he was a thing in Japan, Dude, huh? big thing, man. Yeah. And that's what I, that's why when, when I, when they, I came out first, and it was like, ooh, you know, I had to paint the barefoot, the fur. And then they go, eh, Gypsy Joe, he comes out and the place explodes, warrior pop, road warrior pop. I'm like, what the hell? And he, they're going nuts for this guy. I'm like, okay, so they know him here. <laughs> Next thing I know, it's like he's beating the shit out of me. Yeah. Like, I mean, bro. And we went over to Magic. Yeah, we do maybe tackle, drop down, you know, yeah. Uh, uh, go easy, my neck, my shirt. He's telling me, oh, what a rib. Oh. And uh, yeah, and then the rest of the tour was awesome. So yeah. I'll never forget that. That's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Gypsy. And then, I mean, God, fuck. You saw that Gypsy Joe New Jack YouTube clip. <laughs> yeah, craziness. Good Lord. Crazy. But it, it shows how crazy that. Gypsy Joe is nuts, still, yeah. nuts, um, but a heart of gold. A good, good. Was good he a good dude? Yeah, dude, he had a bullet hole. He just got shot. Oh he lived in Nashville. And he got shot. He threw him in the locker room. Cause, yeah, I got shot. I got grazed. And for wrestling this, or life? No, in life in just, a bar. He got like a hole in the side. He pulls the bandage. He goes, yeah, I got the. I'm like, what the fuck? Yo, so, <laughs> <Dude, laughs> I mean, maybe it's different, but Jewish kid from the suburb, I would have been like, <laughs> what world am I yeah, in? Yeah, it was crazy. But I guess, bro. I guess you're a New York. I was Brooklyn New York dude. street kid, but I still was a little bit like, all right, this guy, you know, when I saw the bullet gimmick, I'm like, all right, maybe he's, maybe, maybe he's a little tougher than they're yeah. telling me. All I would think is like, I don't think my mom would want me to be here. <laughs> like, that's my mindset. <laughs> no, but it was, so then it ended up, uh, you know, I was working. The Tasmania thing started catching on, you know, in the New York, New Jersey area, like as far as indie shows. Mm -hmm. We'll call them indie shows for lack of terms because there's no name. Right. And uh, up in New England and all that jazz. And then uh, I ended up, you know, Heyman, Paul Heyman always kind of liked, he saw videotape on me. And a guy named Ted Petty, 
if you remember Teddy, God rest his soul, you know, from, from Public Enemy, you know, Rock or Rock and all. He worked as a cheetah kid back then, and he was real close with Johnny. He, Johnny used to rent all his rings, and uh, he lived in Jersey. So we would come down to Johnny's dojo back in the day and work with the guys a lot. So he, he, he liked me, Teddy, and helped me. Mm-hmm. And, then, uh, um, and then it ended up being that um, <sighs> Teddy uh, was doing all the rings for ECW, Eastern Championship Wrestling. Mm-hmm. And, and, but he, I, I mean, I'm, I'm missing something. So while Paul was, this is what I want to tell you, was in the NWA, or before it was WCW, when he was doing like commentary and he was a manager, he kind of had a little bit of influence with the office, and he reached out to me, and he got my number from Ted, and was like, I'm trying to get your book down here to get you on a real deal. I'm like, you're kidding me. Wow. Was, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it never panned out, but he had me on a, a short list of guys that he wanted to bring in. I was one of the guys. Did any of the, were there, was there a list? Maybe, uh, maybe <sighs> Jack, Cactus Jack, Bob. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if Mick was on the list. I don't tell you the truth. I don't lie. I don't know who was on the list. Mm-hmm. He didn't share that with me, right. but... Um, I would assume, you know, uh, several guys that end up in ECW were on that list, yeah. you know. Yeah, and there you go. Yeah, so, so then and when he took over kind of the whole ECW thing, Paul just, well, even before that, IWCCW, mm-hmm. he ended up taking the book over for about a week, Paul, and he brought me in there. But I had some heat with them because I had left because I didn't want to do a job for somebody because I was an idiot kid. And they said, fuck you, you're done. You're never working in the state of New York again. You're out. Because he had big influence with the Athletic Commission. Mm. I'm like, all right, well, now you're telling me I'm not going to do something. So now I'm going to get even, I'm going to, I'm driven. Hard, hard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Paul yeah. comes back in. He calls me. He's like, bro, I'm, I'm, I'm booking this thing here with Savoldi. I go, okay, well, they don't like me. Yeah. He goes, I know. I know they don't. They told me they don't want you. But I want you. I'm the booker. You come. You come to up to Middletown, the Catskills. We work, and you're gonna work. And then whew, there was some pushback from <laughs> the guy who paid you, you know. And but I worked a bunch of TVs, and and then uh, Paul got fired or f- quit or whatever happened because yeah. Joe Pettacino took the book over. It was just craziness. You know what? When I when I when I look back at like like I said like you know just watching ECW from an outside perspective, I see all those stars, and you see the the individual stars. But the reality is, it's like a brother system, right? Like this yeah. guy helped me. Ted was doing the ring. Yeah, you know, that's it's all kind of. He had the ring. Yeah, dude. No, for real, the rings. Yeah, and his rings were good. And yeah. like right, Mikey just was there because he was helping the ring. I yeah, mean, Mikey was on. Yeah, that's exactly what happened. Mikey was on the ring crew, just helping out, making ten bucks, twenty bucks, yeah. and and he was one of the guys. I think he was one of the guys who were getting the ring before the show. Just checked the ring out, right. and Paul saw him and was like, "Ah, look at this guy." You know, but, and, you know. In my head at that time, it's just like you know, you wonder where like the, he plucks these guys out, or he finds these guys, or he scouts them. It's like no, nah, they're just around. Yeah, it's, <laughs> and he makes them a star. He right? does. And you know what the thing with Paul, man, he was always no matter if he were the main event or opening match guy. He would always take time to talk to the boys. He was always a, always cool with the guys. You know, before the whole thing with the checks and all that, years later. Mm-hmm. And he always was cool with everybody. He, he, you know, he came up the right way, you know, always respectful to the talent. You know, I mean, you know, you know guys like him back then that weren't wrestlers or a cornet, these guys understood, you know right. what I mean? They, 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 they knew the business, you know? Uh, you... you- this is correct. You were in the like working in the office, like shipping stuff, and uh, well, n- is that correct? It's, it's a little incorrect. See, so then you know, once I, ECW that, started taking over, I love that idea. So yeah, I'd well, like to hear what you did. I guess I, I'll tell you. Yeah. The Dreamer had like had a lot to do with that. Yeah. So, real simple, Paul. I, I, you know, I started to get over after I hurt my neck. I came back. We kind of killed the Tasmaniac, and this Taz guy developed, and then I got hurt. So then I come. Now I'm out nine months, so we just started to do the regular Taz guy without, you know, wearing boots, wrestlers, wrestlers, shooter style guy, and then boom, I break my neck. So now, just as I'm starting to get pushed, how did you break your neck? Sorry, spike pile driver in Fort Lauderdale for ECW. It was a tag match, me and Eddie Guerrero against Two Cold Scorpio and Dean Malenko, and we worked all over the place with this same tag match. Eddie and I were the baby faces. The heat was on me. Why I was the guy that had to sell, I have no idea. When mm. I was horrible at it, and Eddie was awesome at it, but right. Eddie had a much better come. Eddie was just better than me in general, so Eddie had a great comeback. So whatever, but so the heat was on me, and <clears throat> they did a spike pile driver off the second rope. Uh, a Dean, it was my fault. He, he hooked me for the pile driver. Scorp came down, grabbed my boots, spiked me, and I landed on my forehead, my whole body uh, supine. Yeah, good. I just my timing was off. I didn't grab. You know, it was just it was just you know as as you spot. hit, were you like, oh that I'm, I knew it. You know, everything went numb, dude. Uh, everything went numb, and and Dean knew it, Scorp knew it, Eddie knew it, and so uh, I don't remember. I think it was Dean, and and they started Dean and uh, Scorp started you know getting heat with the audience. Eddie's telling me, bro, roll roll to the apron, roll, and I started to come back a little bit. 
I couldn't stand up. And I kind of just rolled to the apron. And then Eddie got in and just did the whole match. The match. And I tried to get I – couldn't, I couldn't stand up. That's good. And, like, uh, also, it's like the outlaw world of ECW. Like, yeah. I, I would know this from the indies. It's like – I don't know. If, there was probably not a medic. I don't know. Maybe there uh, was. But it's just like no, there wasn't. So to be what, honest with you, <laughs> you just get in someone's car and they drive. Dreamer, the yeah. Tommy yeah. brought me to the hospital, and I was. And you probably shouldn't have been sitting in a car no, or bump on a bumpy road. No, I probably <laughs> right. Like you've been stabilized and taken on an ambulance. Dude, I walked in the hospital. Yes, that's uh, yeah, and then yeah, they'd yeah. all this test me. Like how did they said how did you walk in here? I said I just walked. Yeah. You know, not fast, but right. I walked. They go, you're, you're in bad shape. Amazing. So. Nine months later, I came back. And what, is, pa- what do you got in you? You got a. I didn't have surgery. Oh, just re, just it, because back then they weren't going through the front and mm-hmm. all that stuff, and I didn't want the back get cut. So I was just, I just, dude, it was a bitch. I just did all just tons of physical therapy. Uh, I was living on Long Island. I was married. Just got back from my honeymoon, mind mm-hmm. you. And um, Paul, you know, the company was starting to make a little money, and I was terrified because you know we had like a gentleman's agreement how much money I'd make, and he's like, Taz, you're gonna be out a while. You just got married. I'm going to pay you every week. Wow. And I'm like, really? He goes, really? He goes, just take your time. And sure enough, he did, man. And that's why I was so loyal for so long. And, um, you know, uh, and it ends up being when I, while I was out and it was a shoot, like the office, no one was sending like, you know, letters like, hey, hope you're doing well. Like the boys weren't calling me. Like no one gave a shit. Mm. And I was getting hotter and hotter and hotter. And I was calling Paul. I'm like, I'm hot, I'm hot, I'm hot for months and months and months. And, and I just cut this promo to Paul on the phone, how angry I was. And, he's like, and, and I never really wanted to talk on the mic because I wasn't good at it. And he said, Taz, that's your promo when you come back. Oh. And I'm like, what promo? I go, I'm not saying this in front of people because, yes, you are. And that's kind of how it all happens. So that's how you, being a great mic man, and eventually a commentator and, like, known yeah. for your voice. Yeah, I know. It's crazy. <laughs> Dude, that's because of Heyman. I got to put him over. I hate to put him over, but I got to. <laughs> but based off of your rage because nobody would say hi Shoot. to you. <laughs> yeah. No one cared about poor Taz. What about Taz? Forget Raven. What right, about right, Taz? Right. Yeah, so, so, yeah, you know. So uh, it, was it in that nine months that you started doing office stuff or you didn't do office no, stuff? No, no. Okay, all. let me get this. So, yeah. Sorry about that. No, so what okay. happens is now I'm back. And I'm really, now I got this heel thing going, me and Fonzie, he's the manager, Sabu Heat, all this kind of stuff. And, you know, and it just really was just on fire. And, you know, our agreement, Paul and I kind of ended. So it was like, Taz, I want you to stay here. We got to pay you more money. I go, yes, I'm in. More money. I like that. Hmm. So he I need, goes, I need um, an Escalade. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No. <laughs> but anyway, so. He says, I want to have a wrestling school where guys get trained the right way slowly. Mm. I don't want guys just, you know, rough shotting in the business. I take your time with guys. I want you to run the school. I go, I'm not leaving New York. I just, you know, I just where we live. And he goes, no, no, you find a spot nice. on Long Island. So a young wrestler named Bubba Ray Dudley, you know, I talked to him because he knew a lot of some people, you know, in New York that had some real estate connections. Yeah, years later, I mean, just on the street, like, not on the street, but like, he was a guy getting buildings and shit, right? Oh, like, he, he was. Just knows people. He, yeah, he yeah, just yeah. he just knows people. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what we'll just leave it at that. Yeah. So uh he got this building in Deer Park, New York, which is Long Island. And uh, you know, and he got it through this guy named Biagio, who's a cement guy. And uh it's a shoot. Name. That's it's a shoot, the whole thing. He owned the cement company. And uh Long Island Cement, it was called. Simple name, right? Simple marketing. And we got this building next to a chop shop, and uh me and Bubba. Bubba worked in the school, and I, Paul said, who do you want that? I said, I want Mikey Ripwreck in there to help out because he's such a great bump taker, and he lives on Long Island. And he just brought in this team called the Eliminators. And I said, I want this guy, Perry Saturn, to work with me as like an, kind of a quasi-assistant trainer. He goes, well, they live up in Boston. I said, well, let me talk to them. And then sure enough, I helped them find an apartment uh, on Long Island, <clears throat> the Eliminators, Cronus and, and Saturn, and the rest is history. And then that's kind of what happened with the school. So in that school... I ran the wrestling operations of it with Perry, and uh, Bubba uh, basically ran, got the buildings out of there. He had an office in the dojo. We mm. fixed it up really nice, hooked it up. Uh, Paul put money into it. It was a really cool little spot. Mm. And uh, Dreamer up in Westchester where he lived, him and uh, Little Guido, they were kind of handling all the merchandise, and they had a warehouse, and I never been to that warehouse all the years in ECW. I never been there, right? And they Things were going so well that we ended up, he had to stock some of the merchandise on Long Island in the dojo because we had room, like another warehouse. So 
I guess that's that's what we yeah. call. Office. You didn't design something? Oh no, I did. Yeah, I designed all all of the logos. Then maybe that's what it was. Yeah, that's what it was. Okay. All of the pay per view logos, the boys' t shirts. Wow. Are you a, are you an artist? I taught myself how to do graphic design back then because Paul didn't have money to pay someone. You did what Microsoft Paint? No, I <laughs> I um I would kind of I had this guy who would print the silk screen who'd make the t shirts. He had a Corel Draw program. Uh, when it first came out, and he taught me how to use the Corel Draw gimmick, and okay. then uh, and that's how it happened. Fun. Okay. Yeah, and it was a hobby. It was just a hobby. Sure, and it just sure. I still design all my own oh, stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you're wearing a Tash sh- yeah, show like shirt right now. That's show, very bro. cool. Tash show. Way. We're gonna get to that. Uh, yes. Uh, we got. We got. So we, yeah. We need at least thirty minutes for the Tash show. Yeah. We, no, I'm joking. Like, I'm joking. No. Stop. <laughs> I'm teasing. I'm teasing. But uh, okay. So the last thing I do want to hit on, and I do, we'll talk about your your, your radio show, your new podcast, and everything. <laughs> but um, uh, just I, I guess that moment where you went into MSG, right? Like, yeah. Uh, I mean, like, you know, I, I I love the underdog story. You know, I feel as myself, I'm an underdog. And so, um, you know, I'd like to think that you think of yourself as an underdog, especially sure. going into that moment. Uh, yes. But a couple things about that moment. Yeah. I did a podcast about this when I first started with the podcast deal. See, when I first was talking with WWE before I left ECW, you know, ECW now was hot, hot, hot. And Vince Russo was writing, he was the main guy with Vince, and Vince Russo liked ECW and he liked my stuff you know I never knew Vince I never met him he was a New York guy but I didn't know the guy Mm. he contacted me and he's the guy who courted me to come there and then I met with Vince McMahon and and stuff and 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 uh and ended up signing with them but the the gimmick was not supposed to be that I was like some underdog guy I was supposed to come in like pretty hot and heavy and and I've even told this story The, the original idea Russo had for me to come in was at the time Ken Shamrock was hot and he had the uh, the what do we call it, the Lions Den gimmick he used to do remember he used to do that with WWF he did something with Owen Hart and like a weird you know what you mean he had like, like a, a weird MMA cage I can't, yeah 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 I can't yeah. remember what, what the name of it was and he was going to do some another legit UFC fight or MMA fight whatever I don't know if it was UFC back then it might have been but and Russo they had to get him off TV but they they were getting good ratings with this cage gimmick, mm-hmm. this little mini cage. So he, I was supposed to come in and end up getting an angle with, with Shamrock, defeating him and taking over the cage until he came back, then put him over. Mm-hmm. It never happened. <clears throat> I don't know why, but that just never happened. And, and Oh, I know why, because Russo quit mm-hmm. and went to WCW. That's why it never happened. Yeah. Hello. And uh, anyway, and then when I came in, yeah, I didn't know what they were going to do with me. And I, they put me against Kurt, and all that stuff happened. And, and at the Garden, it was amazing. But I even told the story on my show. Dude, Colt, when I came out at the Garden, and they popped like they did, Yeah, I knew I was doomed. Doomed? Doomed. You weren't like, yeah, like I hope my people cheer for me, and then you come out and they do no, cheer for no, you? No, I, I <laughs> was just concerned that they, no one would know me. And they all knew me. Right. Because of the power that ECW had in New York. Yeah. But as I'm walking out, I'm realizing, as I'm literally walking to the ring, I had this surreal moment. I'm like, this pop is insane. I'm getting goosebumps talking about it right now. And while I was walking down, but the pop wasn't made by the WWE. And I knew enough. Yeah, you knew that. I was around the business enough. Yeah. I knew they're going to you know, give me a makeover. Right. And that's kind of what happened. Fuck, man. Yeah. But so, I, but to just, God, so you didn't even get to live in that moment? That one night. And I knew it when I watched back the, the match and I heard the commentary. Yeah. And I heard... You're saying, like, in that moment, as you come out, did you get to live into it or were you... Oh, much, yeah. You too much in your head? Well, I, I was... Oh, I loved it, dude. It was, I'll never forget, it was the greatest moment of my professional life. Yeah. But when I heard the commentary back the next day in catering, uh, we were in Philadelphia doing Raw, and I... They were having monitor, as you know, and, and, and catering, the boys would watch the, the pay-per-view while they were eating, and I heard JR's commentary and it went, this whole illegal choke thing, that was never discussed. That was never, that, so that I don't know. I guess that happened on headsets in in Jr's ear and, and King's ear. You know. Oh shit! They like him. Uh, make I, his move illegal. My kid, he called, <laughs> Jr. called me a human suplex machine once yeah. during that match, and then that was it. And next thing you know, I'm a human wrecking machine. Like, what was that? Well, in my contract, my IP, my intellectual property, yeah. was the human suplex machine. Was TAZ. Mm-hmm. You know, all that was mine in our negotiations. They were like, yeah, you could have all that. We're not going to use it. They didn't tell me that. but <laughs> And that's good business by them. I'm not yeah, knocking right, them, right, that's just course. the way, you know, yeah. that's just... How it is, um, know? and then uh, listen, another thing that's uh, that I love is is the longevity in the career. Uh, always in it, you know, you made the decision. You know, I don't, I think it was your kind of decision, like, hey, maybe this commentator role is, is it was Vince gives it okay. I'll tell you the truth, like, uh, I, I, um, you know, I, I had an, I tore my bicep, 
uh, when I was only there a few months, and then I was out. They took care of me on that, paid me and all that stuff. Came back, pushed me, and the SmackDown started to become popular, and they had Jerry Lawler doing both shows. Mm. So Vince came to me. He said, look, uh, you know, uh, we're going to do an angle tonight where you get into it with Lawler, and then tomorrow night on SmackDown, I think it was, you'll sit in with Michael Cole for like one match and mock King. Just, I said, yeah, okay, I'll try it, no problem. And... They kept me out there like more than one segment. I'm like, okay, no one's telling me nothing. Am I supposed to leave? Look at my Cole's like, I don't know. Yeah. And um, and then the angle got heavier with, with Lawler, and then uh, it ended up segueing into you know Vince saying, look, I, I think you have a future in this, and I want to help you. You live in New York. You're 40 minutes from the studio. I want to set you up to train in the studio. And they would have me with other guys wow. learning how to be a commentator. It's almost a testament to being in in the business and being too good at like everything. <laughs> like, you know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> yeah, there's, I, there's people out there who are like, oh, like, hey, like, you know, like, hey, do this. And they're like, all right. And they've yeah. been, they're just, they've yeah. been around wrestling. It's kind yeah, of thing. Like, hey, same thing. Oh, well, yeah, sure. I've, I've been around wrestling for so long. Exactly. Yeah, and, yeah. It, and the commentary thing, making that transition was not easy. I mean, it was hard and it was a challenge. I didn't want to do it. Mm. My wife's like, look, this is a way for you to get yeah, out of the ring and, and it's a longer life, you know? And sure enough, I was smart enough to know that, but it was hard, man. I'd imagine. You know, and, and it was hard. And then, you know, and I, I just worked at it, you yeah. know? And, um, you know, I was, as a commentator, I was in a quiet taste. Some people didn't like my commentary, but. The guy who paid me did. Yeah, you know. <laughs> I mean, well, listen, we're all acquired taste. To yeah, yeah, you know. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and then the, and so now you're, you're podcasting and you're yeah. and, and not only podcasting, you have a deal with CBS yeah. Radio. Straight deal. Yeah, it's and, crazy. And uh, like, what a great again another transition of longevity yeah. in wrestling. Different ways, finding ways, hustler man. We're hustlers. That's it, bro. Finding I mean, ways. you know, I've said it to you on my show. I've said it. When you're not on my show, I've always looked at you as the pioneer of this whole podcasting for people from the business. I you appreciate know? it. Yeah. And I mean that, you know. And anybody who's a fan of the human podcast machine, I've said that about Cole Cabana a billion times. Uh, and maybe not a billion, but maybe a couple hundred. So, uh, <laughs> you know. So, it it was, uh, you know, I, I wanted to be a little bit different than like watching these other guys that were doing podcasts where yours was more conversational. Mm -hmm. And, and I kind of... I'm like, I like what this guy does because it's a conversation. Like you and I right now, we're sitting here. There's no script, man. No. You're not looking at questions. You're just <laughs> talking to me, and that's kind of my deal too. And so I guess I quasi copied that style, you know. I mean, uh, and and then for the first, when CBS came to me with the podcast, I'm like, yeah, I'll give it a shot. I was working for TNA as a commentator. I was, you know, you know how podcast is. You don't make a ton of money, you know, mm -hmm. out of the gate. And after about two months of doing podcasting, I'm like, you know, I kind of want to go even a different direction. And CBS was like, whatever you want to do, your numbers are cool. And I kind of got away from like not a ton of. I didn't. I wasn't big into the guesting. Yeah. More topic driven as opposed to guest driven. It's and hard to. Re it's almost hard to rely a little bit. Like this way. It's rough. This way. If it's if you're not relying on you know it's hard for me because I have to make sure I'm on the road every single yeah. you know week. <laughs> well, you're kind of like a podcast diva, bro. Because it's like with you, it's got to be in person. That's yeah, like I yeah. mean I respect it, but I'm like this cult. He's really starting to get me hot. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I like that because it's not on the phone, so mm -hmm. it, it's good for your fans to hear that. And yeah, listen to your show. But it's you know? also so, but that's good. For, uh, in the perfect world, I'd probably have a show where I, I didn't have to like have guests because yeah. You know, then it's never there's. It's just on you. Like, yeah. If you have the hustle, and, the, and yeah. then you can do it. You can get it done. No, it is, bro. Like for me to to do point of view shows on wrestling shows on TV or pay per views, it's easy for me because to be frank with you, uh, when you're a color commentator and you're a, and you're an accomplished color commentator who's making money uh, for a living, your ego has to stay in the locker room, and you have to put everybody over. You have to put the brand over, the mm -hmm. talent over. I never had a problem with that. So I have no problem going on the air and doing a, a show and talking about a, a brand, WWE, TNA, Ring of Honor, whoever, you know. Uh, I have no problem with that. Some guys do have a problem with that. Mm. I don't, you know. So uh, I'm confident in myself. So uh, it ended up segueing you know, with CBS. I'm a New York guy. They're a New York-based company. So I... You know, I had done some radio with them years ago. I remember that. Yeah, they were doing a form, a platform called Free FM. Okay. Uh, guy talk stuff, and they had me do a bunch of shows, but I never got a deal. And I did some stuff with Sirius Radio, but I never had a real deal. And I thought it'd be cool to have a show about the business, like a full-time daily show, because no one really on a high level has ever really done that. Mm -hmm. And CBS, uh, they saw the numbers, and they saw my work ethic, because I signed with them in November, and the platform started in January. And for two months, I was up at their offices within their studio 
at least three days a week on my own dime, doing imaging for my show, um, building the show, uh, submitting concepts to them and different stuff in the show, in the podcast. And they're like, this guy is a pit bull. He really, this is not a money grab to him. This right. is a guy that has a passion for this. I just did a, an upfront, right, for this IAB advertising, you know, for, for a podcast for CBS. And I, I talked about podcasts and they invited me to do this, right? In this thing, I explained, I started talking about the business. And you got a bunch of advertisers and salespeople, they have no idea what about our business. Mm. And I said, I'm telling you about sacrifices and bumps and bruises and stitches and missing my son's first step, his first word, all this kind of stuff that we all have these stories as wrestlers. I'm telling you guys this for a reason, because when CBS came to me about a podcast, I didn't look at it as a podcast. I didn't, I didn't look at it as this Taz thing and get myself over. I looked at it as they want me to do a show and it's going to encompass my life's work. I have pride in my life's work, my body of work. Because it affected my family and my life. And it, it's life experience of who I am. So I always looked at it like that. You know what I mean? It's a little deep. Mm. You know, but I'm shooting, you know? Of course. And, and then they said, uh, after, I don't know, I want to say six months, and, and I was having issues with TNA, getting my check on time. And I'm like, I said, guys, you know, you know, we've kind of breached the deal here a few times, and I'm done with this. Because CBS said, when you're done with those guys, we want to do a full-time you know, daily gimmick, and it's you know, it's it's nice to um, people want to deal with people who are passionate about the stuff. Amen. Yeah, <laughs> amen. You know, <laughs> so uh, the, 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 I signed with them in the summer, or early in the summer with CBS. For, I ripped up the other podcast contract, signed a new deal, and which was supposed to kick off, I think, like the day after Labor Day, but we pushed it back to September fourteenth, which this is a podcast, but yeah, that'll be done, that's yeah. being passed, but whatever, and uh, and it's a daily show, morning drive, seven a.m. to nine a.m. Eastern. And it's I it's the Taz show, Body Slams and Beyond, and it's it's gonna it's ninety percent wrestling talk, you know, uh, live phone lines, the whole deal. Straight. I mean, I'm fortunate with CBS because they have all the resources, mm-hmm, you know, mm-hmm. uh, and I'm right there, you know. Uh, and then I'll talk football, I'll talk you know mainstream sports, you know, and guests from here here and there, you know that type of thing. Sure. When you came on my show, I was, did that week of Taz Live. That was kind of the test. That was a test. Yeah. 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 That's so, great, man. So, yeah, that's, that's kind of what happened. So cool. Um, so that's been plugged, like, that, but it can all be on play.it, is that right? Yeah, it's really easy to find. TazShow.com, great. which takes you right to play.it, and, you, and, and there's a video element. So now they put in all robotic cameras in the studio, oh, not nice. just some GoPro hostage shot. Yeah, you yeah, know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's straight cameras, just like you'd watch Boomer and Carton or any other radio show on TV or online. And they, ha- they own, CBS owns play.it, which is one of their online networks. They own radio.com. And the show's also on Spotify and TuneIn. So it's like... That's huge. It's, it's on a lot that's of huge. spots. Uh, you're on Twitter? Official, what's the other social, social stuff? Uh, that's it. At Official Taz. I got an Instagram thing. I don't even know the name. Oh, it's Taz Talk. Yeah. The, all right. Yeah, I, I put stuff on there. But the Twitter's at Official Taz. And, and you got a huge following. So hopefully some of your fans will want to listen to my show too. Yeah. It's a daily show. And obviously I'm going to have you on the show whenever you want to come on. And... And you're gonna have to get up early though, bro. Yeah, I know that's. The, I'll, you're I'll thinking, figure, oh, wait a minute. I'll figure Friday when I'm <laughs> flying out at like ten, and I'll call in early. I uh, appreciate you being on, bud. Oh man, I appreciate it, Cole. Thank you, buddy. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, great to have Taz on, and uh, go check out his show. It's not a podcast. It's a it's a daily show. He wants to make that very clear. Hopefully, uh, hopefully, I'll sneak on some of those. And you can hear my voice on the airwaves if, you, uh, if you're if you into that type of thing. All right, before we get out of here, let's get into some plugs and... Upcoming events! All right, the best way you can support ColtMerch.com, DigitalColt.com, Twitter and Instagram, at Colt Cabana, Facebook slash AOW Podcast. I got a very public email, ColtWrestling at gmail.com. Maybe you're a promoter, want to put me on your upcoming show or a convention. CutMyPromo.com is the YouTube series I have. Check out my YouTube channel. Also, ColtCabana.com is my website where you can check out everything, including the P.O. Box that I have. Send me some snail mail. Upcoming Saturday, October 3rd in the afternoon, Monroe, New Jersey, LegendsOfTheRing.com. That's a convention at Night Union, New Jersey, ProWrestlingSyndicate.com. Wrestling Kurt Hawkins, Brian Myers. Saturday, October 10th, Enfield, Connecticut, us versus them wrestling.com. October 16th through November 8th, 
going to Japan. Use that Google Translate on noah.co.jp. Friday and Saturday, November 13th and 14th, Philadelphia and Queens, New York, houseofhardcore.net. And Sunday, November 15th, Hamilton, Ontario, Canada, I believe, not Toronto. Doing a live Art of Wrestling at 2 o'clock. The show itself starts at 4 o'clock. That's all done at alpha-1wrestling.com. And Saturday, November 28th, Winston-Salem, North Carolina. Come see me and the rest of the world at wrestlecade.com. That is the show for this week, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you supporting and hopefully subscribing. Subscribe to the show. You'll get it every week for free. It's a little surprise that comes to you. Thanks to Taz for coming on the show this week. Thanks to Cable Guy Jeff and Stu Stone, Kid Russell, Matt Jenkins on the music, Dane Miller with the tech help. Thanks to our sponsors, HighSpots.com. Hundreds of full-length titles available to download. $5 wrestling titles, AMA knee pads, gear, mask, and now they're kind of doing a wrestle crate type thing. Check that out, HighSpots.com. OneHourTees.com. They help run ProWrestlingTees.com. You cannot get a Jim Neidhart shirt there because WWE doesn't want you to. But you can support your favorite independent wrestlers and legends at ProWrestlingTees.com where they will get a sweet check if you buy their t-shirt. TweakedArie.com slash Colt, the earbuds that I use. Get over 30% off and free shipping just because you listen to the show. That's it. We're done for the week. Some of you guys saw on the uh, Art of Wrestling Facebook page, I was asking some audio questions. Hopefully they'll fix next week. I ordered like $500 worth of gain and preamp stuff. I don't even know what it means. I'm just praying I plug it in and it works. We'll see. I mean, that's literally thanks to DraftKings and Tops that I could just go on there and easily buy that. So I appreciate you for uh, gambling online for football. Also, that show in Chicago, come to it. It's at the Cards Against Humanity headquarters. They wanted me to let you know that there is no like crazy, they're not doing any crazy Cards Against Humanity stuff, but... They did give me a shitload of Cards Against Humanity stuff, so I have that now. Maybe maybe you and I can play after the show. Maybe we'll play a giant games of cards. Um, that'll be a lot of fun. I thought, listen, I had to sell Marty hard on Wednesday before Thanksgiving, but I think it's the right move because I, I remember doing absolutely fuck all, and I don't want to drink. There's people that don't want to go party. Plus, the show's done at fucking 10. You can go out and get hammered afterwards. Makes sense. It's going to be a great show. Join Marty and I. Probably some friends, right? Wink. Remember last time. Good show. All right. I'm out of here. Hey, guys. This has been The Art of Wrestling. For Cole Cabana, I'm Cole Cabana. Thanks. You know, ever since I came home to Minnesota, I've been hearing how the twins are hurting without Carew. Well, don't count on it. Guys like Erickson, Goltz, and Marshall have given us some of the best pitching we've had in years. New guys like Landro and Jackson have already helped us. And Roy Smalley's become a star. Sure, a lot of people have written us off. Well, that's okay. Right, because now we've got something to prove. Tell them like it is, Coos. Right, right. The Minnesota Twins. This year, we've got something to prove.